he goes to the University of Georgia. His name is Stetson Bennett the fourth. He's yeah. the starting quarterback and a member of a fraternity. He drank twenty eight thousand beers last night. I'm just gonna go ahead and clock it. All right. Is he running Daddy's hedge fund when it's uh, when it's all said and done? No, Daddy ain't got a hedge fund. This no. is gonna be a car dealership. We've already established <laughs> this. This is gonna be St- Stetson Bennett Kia of Blackshear Waycross. <laughs> Did you enjoy last night's game? I always enjoy them. Um, I, I I think like on the scale of enjoyment, it was you know it was like about a six and a half out of ten. That's it. Like it was you know, I, I, both teams were so tight for the first half and had such nerves that I don't think they really got loose. And I always hate it when a major player leaves. Jameson Williams gets injured, and that takes something out of the game for me. Not because I wanted Bama to win. It was by the way, for a hater like me, it was funny no matter what happened. There's just different ways of it, but but once Williams is out, you know that that's kind of disappointing. So that takes it down a notch because you want the best players on the field. It's pretty simple. They're without their top two wide receivers, not at the start of the game, but for the most for most of the game, as you pointed out. If I put those two guys back in and they're healthy, is the outcome different? I don't think the outcome is different given how they were pressuring and playing Bryce Young, and given it, uh, Bama's inability to run the ball. They really didn't have any protection off play action. Also, they got manned up at the line. That's You can't beat that. Like, when the line of scrimmage, when Georgia wins the line of scrimmage, man, it didn't really stand a chance. In the trenches, it was especially violent to watch. Uh, mm-hmm. What other bowl game that you can remember in recent history had that kind of violence in the trenches? Uh, besides the Cal TCU cheese it bowl. Um, <laughs> let me see uh, that kind of violence in the trenches. The last one I remember was in the playoff Clemson versus Ohio state. That was the most violent. That's still the most violent high profile bowl game I've seen. I don't think that that Ohio state defense was uh, on one that night. And I don't think Clemson, like I don't think Clemson's really been the same since they, you know, they, they didn't they they took something out of the that game so mike ryan's been telling me all year and he listen he lost the bet that mattered but he was right in telling me and the bet that mattered was the sec championship game mike lost that he'll lose his hair eventually i think i mean so. overwhelming public support for me to keep my hair spencer so no, i want to make not. the fa- i owe the fans and i want to make them happy yes i i bet sue god said the Georgia defense was the best defense I'd ever seen, and they would cover the spread, and we had a fine bomb, uh, a fine bomb haircut riding on the line. But all of that is absolved with a dominant performance that we saw in the national championship. Even Spencer would agree. You're an asshole. But, Spencer, I do wonder, I wonder, do you agree with Mike? Is that the best defense you've seen in college football? Yeah, that's the best defense. They had a bad game. But top to bottom, that's the best defense. And I will say – T- top to bottom in terms of ingredients a lot of times defenses are made up by their harmony and how they play together and their teamwork no 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 I- i'll take you point for point i would take everyone on this team i do think that you can get them a little bit on the back end but we say like oh you could get some yardage off their defensive backfield yeah that's true but that's a relative term because you get nothing you get nothing up front so to me this is a better team especially because the offenses they're playing are more sophisticated than ever before i would remind everybody last night by the way the mind-boggling thing is we go whoo that defense did a great job on bryce young bryce young's that the, he was a first year starter that this is his first year right. and we're, we're giving him credit and, and by the way <laughs> this is all accurate we are duly awarding credit for bryce young being like oh hey you beat bryce young man that is a that is an achievement yep i'd remind everybody it's an achievement and he's a freshman not but and I mean, he's 18, 19 years old. Like, the poise on that kid is ridiculous. It is absurd. Like, can you, you remember being 18 or 19? Do you think you could have been that fearless about anything and been right? You could have been fearless about something, but you'd be stupid, right? Like, yeah, I can jump off the third floor balcony into the pool. The hotel's fine with it, right? Like, that's the only thing you'd be that way about. Like, Bryce Young's out there doing this at a high level in front of, you know, millions of people on TV and at the best university for football in the nation. Although t- today that has to be Georgia, I guess. In, in watching Bryce Young in person, it was almost as if you didn't want to pressure him because he would somehow be calmer in it and make yep. something happen. And it was, it ended up being worse for certainly Miami and that kickoff game that they had against Alabama. The more pressure they got, the more he torched them. 
And even in the wake of that violence in the trenches, bodies flying everywhere, still pretty unflappable. Despite not having like that that Heisman performance, everyone comes away from his performance understanding that this is one of the greatest defenses ever. You called him the best ever. He yeah. is so unflappable. It's bonkers. I, I'm I'm fine with saying that it is the best ever because this to me is the cap. This is the ribbon that you put on the present and say, yep, that best ever you beat. Bryce Young, who is a brilliant college football quarterback. I have no idea what his prospects are at the next level, and frankly, not my job to care. One of the best college football quarterbacks I've ever seen. One of the best defenses I've ever seen. Violent at every single point of attack. I like When I tell somebody, we go, what was special about this team? They beat ass at 11 different points on the field. There's just so much ass getting beat all over the place. They, their DBs hit hard. I mean, you saw last night, Lewis Seen, this is how sick this and deep this defense is. Every single game you could go, well, that was the MVP. No, no way. That was the MVP. Uh, just a game ago, we watched Jordan Davis, who um, I have stats right. He is 7'3 and 942 pounds, <laughs> at like 15% body fat maybe. Um, we watched him laterally chase down a skill player from behind for Michigan. All right. That's amazing. Something else amazing happened the next game. Lewis Seen ended up being – one of the biggest players. Keely Ringo ended up being uh, having a huge part in the game and getting the game clinching interception off of Bryce Young and the pick six, which he was not supposed to return, y'all. That was the best part. Kirby's <laughs> like yelling for him to get down. Ringo, no. you Honestly, man, trank darts, nets, lassos, nothing. All right? You could have erected barriers and he just would have vaulted them. It was nuts. <laughs> Every single game, there's somebody different. You were never able to zero in on one guy. And to me, this is the defensive equivalent of that 2019 Joe Burrow LSU team where you just say, I could not pin down who to defend because if I don't, if I double to March Chase, all of a sudden I have to deal with Jefferson. And if I deal with him, all of a sudden I have to deal with Clyde Edwards Hilaire out of the background or Moss. It just kept going and going and going. You had no good answers. And that's the thing. I know they're a great defense because if you solve one problem, they just gave you another. That's why the, the entire Heisman Trophy, in retrospect, should have just gone to the defense because someone you're absolutely right. Someone like N'Kobe Dean would have a, a performance against Florida where you're like, he actually might be in the conversation. And then comparative to his teammates for three weeks, he kind of lay, lays low. You couldn't give it to one single player, in your opinion, who would be the single best player on that defense. I'm not talking about next level because you already articulated what your central point of focus is. Right now, on this Georgia defense, who is the single best player? It's Nicobe Dean. I've never seen, like, I, when I've watched Roquan Smith, okay, extremely talented NFL professional football player, I thought I'm never going to see anybody cover, like, hash to hash like that because the dude moved like a cursor, right? Like, across the field, eliminated, and when he got there, he tackled, he tackled well, and he tackled violently, right? It was not only that he brought you down, you just didn't want to see him again. And I didn't, and he had smarts because even if he was in the wrong place, he knew he had makeup speed. Um, Nicobe Dean is better than that. According to PFF, um, since 2014, when they started grading these things, um, there has been one guy, one linebacker who had 90 plus scores out of 100 on pass rushing coverage, and it's Nicobe Dean. That's a class by himself. I and to add on to that, like this is obviously a really physically talented dude. He's brilliant. He's not in the wrong place. I haven't seen him have to make up plays because a lot of the plays he ends up making, he's not supposed to be there. That's not his assignment. He's just helping out, and he ends up being the guy who makes the tackle, right? It's like it, Troy Palomalo. It's, it's bonkers it's, how good he is. It's honestly like Troy Palomalo in the secondary where Peyton Manning didn't have an answer for him because Palomalo would just pop up in places. Like, you're just flatly not supposed to be there. How are you making a play on this ball? Watching the Kobe mm -hmm. Dean, you don't account for the human body making up the kind of ground that he does at the kind of angles he takes, too, because it's hard to really identify, like, where you would line him up in the next level because he could play so many positions effectively just during the course of a play. He's playing multiple positions. I actually think he, I, I said earlier in the show today, I'm like, on the next level, I think that guy's a, a Hall of Famer. I would project him for Canton just based off of what I've seen in college. It, it, and to your point, every game, someone else kind of looks like N'Kobe Dean. Someone else sticks out for drives where they flash that kind of all-pro potential. 
yeah, I think you've seen you've seen very few players who could compare uh, to what he could be at either the next level or whatever he wants to do next. Um, Ed Reed in terms of play recognition and in terms of smarts, uh, Paul Amalu in terms of versatility. Um, I watched one play early in the season that had me absolutely gobsmacked. It was when they were, I believe they were playing Clemson and they have him covering guys out of the slot. Normally you get a linebacker on a skill guy and everyone who plays Madden, right? At that level, right? It immediately recognizes the simple mismatch. Wasn't a mismatch. It was never a mismatch. You could put Kobe Dean on anybody. Duke could play corner. It is disgusting how talented he is. How many, it's a joy to watch. How many, Spencer, how many first round picks are on that defense? Like if if they all went to the draft, how many guys are getting selected in the first round? How many you got? Um five? Damn. Four or five, maybe. Like th- there's there's a tremendous amount. If you go first, second round, you know, we're 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 using all the hands, right? I, they're nuts and it's nuts what they have compiled in terms of a talent differential there versus almost all of their competition. It's, it's the stupidest thing. And I say stupid in like the most admiring tone here, right? Mm -hmm. Just like unfathomable, um, the overkill that they have applied to recruiting and to talent when you got into it last night versus Alabama, Alabama, the only school that can compare when it comes to hoarding wealth. You get their wide receivers and you go, yeah, these guys just can't keep up. That's Alabama. That's the place. That's the place where the wide receivers room is like nine deep. Hmm. And then they're up against Georgia's defense. You're like, no, no, no. They got this. And yet Georgia does all of this with the former walk on quarterback, former Juco guy, guy who drank a little 20. too emotional last night. I got to be honest. No, it's, like, uh, it's really cool. Considering what, the story. what is too emotional? <laughs> he, beat Tampa, he beat, he beat Alabama. The way that I, mean, Spencer, I mean, crocodile tears everywhere. I mean, a little bit much no? no I, th- I think it was super cool. What? With two a minutes little, left too. A little, wait, uh, the emo- uh, emotional cop here <laughs> I showing up. The were emotional you, police. Yes, that's guys, what I am. <laughs> were you watching that kind of like he was doing, he started crying with like over two minutes left and they still had like Alabama had the ball two possession game. I was hoping for a quick score right. just to see Kirby smart yell at the whole sideline. Like <laughs> get your shit together. We still got a game. <laughs> I mean, Celebrate a regardless. little too early when you're playing a Nick Saban team. That's uh, all enough, I'm saying. Enough I mean. Kirby with the, knowing the cameras on you and yelling. <laughs> Like a, a big swig of coffee. I, I'm gonna sign. Is, no, no. Spencer's mad at me because I become the emotional police. Where Stetson yeah. Bennett, like, I act like you've been there before. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. Like, I, I, I have no, like, I lose, I lose my shit at almost anything. So, like, <laughs> like, I, I cry at commercials. I do all of this. The idea of actually winning something, uh, surrounded by a bunch of people looking at me, seems really stressful. <laughs> I'd probably just start losing it on the sideline, like third quarter, right? Like with a one point lead, I'd probably start losing it. So. So I have no room to criticize that's bit, especially when he knows he shouldn't be there. Right. He knows it's that that's a five, <laughs> that's a five, nothing future auto dealership baron of South Georgia out there. He knows he's going pro in something else. Right. He's not, he's not, this is it. Not this o- is it. Go ahead. Cash out. Not only does he know he, he shouldn't be there. He doesn't belong, but he probably also knows he's not going to be the quarterback next year. I mean, <laughs> no, no. Like, did anyone receive worse advice in this whole process than Jamie Newman? Like, I know the, the, the Georgia quarterback situation. This is another thing, by the way. Georgia's managed to hoard so much talent that you can actually be real dumb about how you manage the program. You can just, you know, here, we're going to make a big blunt object. We have these coaches. They're going to build a skilled, baroque, beautiful defense. And we're going to take that whole thing and we're going to power it with an F-150 engine, right? That's basically what they've done. They're like, hey, we got an F-35 of a defense. What are we going to put in as engines? Uh, F-150. That'll do. <laughs> That'll be fine. Like that offense, that offense is nothing special. And it doesn't right. have to be anything special. It was special when they needed it to be, right? It's very, like, I love I love this. I know. I know who is. I know who the media is. Right. I know who makes up most of the media and I know who they think they're pitching to. Right. So Stetson Bennett last night throws a good pass. Right. For a TD. We don't talk about the receiver. We don't talk about the line. We're like, oh, Stetson Bennett did it. Meanwhile, Georgia's defense is out there destroying souls. Right. (laughs) Out there. First rounders at every single point on the attack. And we're like, oh, Stetson Bennett, what an underdog story. Talk about 
go talk about the Transformers. Don't talk about the humans in this story, okay? Talk about the big magical robots that make up this defense. But no, we got to talk about Stetson Bennett, which, I, fine, go ahead. If, if, if that's your thing, go do it, all right? But just admit it that on the other side, you're watching some of the best college defenders of all time in the best single college defense. And, 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 uh, and uh, by the way, not just the defense, offense has got those guys too. Brock Bowers is nuts. Brock Bowers in that offensive line. Nobody wants any part of Brock Bowers in the open field. That's like hitting a car. I mean, they, they already proved it once, to your point, where they're like, uh, yeah, Fields is all right. We'll go with Fromm. And then they're, yeah. uh, <laughs> I think they're about to do it again because Bennett played during the pandemic year. He, I don't, he doesn't have the pro po prospects. He, the, the car dealership can wait another year. And meanwhile, I, I don't know how much uh, there actually is of the Caleb Williams thing. He looks on his way to Los Angeles, but – if you're a quarterback, if you're Jackson Dart, if you're in the portal, you're like, I can go with this if Setson Bennett can do it, but Bennett's just going to kind of be like Van Wilder there and just hang around for a bit, no? <laughs> he's got another decade. <laughs> I, I mean, at this, po at this point, he's a, he's a luck charm. Why would you, like, you, you got to ride this horse until, until it, it collapses because this is the thing that worked for them. This is the thing that got them to Valhalla for the first time since 1980, a joke that will have to be sadly retired. One of the most reliable, <laughs> bankable, bond safe jokes in college football is now dead. We can no longer say that. And the reason is Stetson Bennett. And, you know, Stetson Bennett is uh, a guide star for so many um, schlubby white dudes in Georgia. Like there are so many like, 18, 19 handicappers who are looking at Stetson and they're like, that's going to be my son. I got it. We're going to do this. Do you know how many like young ACLs are going to be ruined? Because everybody thinks they're Stetson Bennett now. Do you know how many like little kids with five, four forties at best are going to get killed on Pop Warner fields because of the example of Stetson Bennett? Think of the damage. It's going to be real. But why do they have to ride this out? Because it seems like what you're saying is if Georgia had a good quarterback, they would have won by 30 last night. They have a good quarterback. They no. don't have a great quarterback. Right. That's the issue. What if right? they had a great now, one? <laughs> and, and, and great ones are hard to find. That's the other thing, too. Like, we got to admit, one, you got to admit Stetson Bennett, he's good and he's timely. And he worked for what they've got. It's not great. Other teams have great ones. In fact, most of the teams that have won championships going back for about 15 years now have had great quarterbacks. By and large, the era of Craig Krenzel, who to me is like a direct comparison for Stetson Bennett in terms of we can't get this dude off the field. The guy who, um, you know, y'all might be familiar with his work against Miami. You didn't need to go. Craig Krenzel. Yeah. To, <laughs> to me, um, I won't linger on that. Sorry. Y'all. Um, to me, that's the comparison, right? This is an outlier because by and large defense does not win championships. I don't think we're seeing like a great sea change. I don't think it's going to be like, well, this is the era of 20, 2017 games coming back. Kirby did it. no, no, that would be denigrating what this defense did and who they are and the, all the work that went into getting these freaks all in the same place. Um, it's not a model for how everybody's going to do it. That's, that's to me, the idea here. I, and Stetson Bennett, they got to they gotta ride him. But, like, if you got a great quarterback, go ahead, switch, because you're right. If they'd had a great quarterback, I don't think this game would have been especially close. Uh, Spencer Hall, host of uh... – Shut down full cast, full cast after dark, which you can find on the Levitard and Friends Network. You mentioned that uh, Georgia had one bad game defensively, and I was dragged publicly for it and uh, am due to pay the consequences for it. But uh, if you watch that film, like Jordan Davis, like he, he's tired. You know, like he, mm -hmm. a, a lot of players on that defense with the pro p prospects put up some bad tape there. And I'm sure they made some tactical adjustments, but everyone said they just like got their cardio up and conditioned themselves for what we saw last like 37 night. days of hell. They were making it out. What, what happened? Was it just that the sec title game just didn't matter? Why do I have to shave my head? Because this defense was always <laughs> obviously very clearly capable of, of doing this. It, it just didn't matter to Georgia. Ultimately one, I think they were fatigued. Um, we tend to underestimate the amount of fatigue carried by a team at the end of the season. Um, I don't think they had their rotations quite right in terms of players. I think they had some issues with uh, managing that. You, you say you only play once a week. That's true. That's true. You do only play once a week. You practice 
way more than that. And the additive cumulative fatigue, uh, especially when it comes to keep it up with a team that was deliberately trying to out sprint you, that was trying to stretch the field on you with guys like Jameson Williams at that time, that's a bad matchup, but the styles make fights, but so does the calendar. Uh, and I think the biggest asset for Georgia here wasn't an extra 20 minutes of cardio. I hate to be the person who says that the one thing is not going to work for you, right? Doctors hate him. Like this, do this one thing and it'll fix your entire defense. Do 20 minutes on a treadmill if you're a 340 pound defensive tackle. Yeah, sure, it's going to help, but what's going to really help is rest, right? Because you've been playing at that high level. You faced a team that was a bad matchup at a bad time. Then you had a month to prepare and rest up. Spencer, follow me down this path. You see what Stetson did last mm-hmm. night. All those tears being that emotional. He made the story all about Stetson Bennett, and the announcers followed suit. He didn't make it about the defense. He didn't make it about the point of attack. He made it about Stetson Bennett, and the announcers just ran with it. You see, it's selfish. Just admit it. Just say it. <laughs> I, I, love, I love you running counter to the general stream of 99% of American mainstream media today by being like, Stetson Bennett villain storyline. Consider it. <laughs> Consider it. Glory hog Stetson Bennett. First of all, he ain't tall enough to be a glory hog. He can't get to the cameras. They got to lift him up. Did you see him next to Jordan Davis? Yes. Did you see him? Ne- yeah. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> that, 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 the was the thing with him and Jordan Davis looks like it looked like a kid came down from the stands and was like, can I have a towel? Yeah, forget right? Jordan can Davis. Can I get an autograph? He was barely seeing over Holly Rowe. Like, exactly. He, he's a small man. <laughs> no. But big that's tears. That's a little man. Big fake tears. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, with his with his fake tears. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, if that if those were fake tears, that man is an endurance fake crier. Because that was a good hour straight. So respect the skill if that's indeed what happened. Spencer, how magical a time is it for you after that game, after seeing some of the emotional stuff that happened? You care about college football uniquely. Do you get palpably sad as soon as it's over? Is today a difficult day for you because you love that machine and you love Saturdays so much? I do. It's a little bit hard. Uh, you're kind of ready for a break. I don't really, you know, it's wild. The rest of the population knows what to do with the Saturday. I have no clue. So this Saturday is going to roll around. And uh, I'm going to discover that I'm going to do what everyone else does on Saturdays, which is chores. That's so there's a lot of things I need to do around the house. <laughs> but on the whole, yeah, like it's 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 sad. Uh, I have a habit of posting Southern University doing Can You Stand the Rain, uh, which is an amazing version of it. That's like the thing I post on Twitter when the season's done. And uh, I get emotional. Like, it's very hard not to these like. I think that's the thing about 18 to 22 year olds is that they really aren't very good at governing their uh, energy output and budgeting. So they just do this as hard as they can. Um, And I think it's very hard to watch it and be around it without sort of trying to respond in kind. So it it does, it does, it takes a lot out of them and um, it's a full sort of 100% commitment on, I think most people's part who follow this thing. Anything you're at the game, right? You were at the game. No, no, no. Let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. I, my, my compatriot, Jason Kirk, who's also on the full cast, was at the game. If you look at Maria Taylor's video from the site, you can see Jason impassive in the back, cool as ever, not really responding to a fantastic play by Keely Ringo to, to clinch the game. Uh, my kids are at home. My kids are remote school this week. So guess who's got to be instructor and commentator at the same time? That is correct. Me. Oh boy. Me. Lucky me. Thanks to COVID. So oh. I did not get to go to the game. You got to be so bummed you miss out on Indiana and, and, and the winner. And hey. The Colts hey, hey, logo. Hey. Listen. <laughs> everyone, like Miami and New Orleans end up being the, the donkey island from Pinocchio, right? It's where adults go and they get turned into donkeys. That's that's what happens when you let adults loose uh, and off the leash and unsupervised in places like Miami and like New Orleans and to an underrated degree, Scottsdale, Arizona, if you're familiar with what happens in the Fiesta Bowl there. Indianapolis, according to everyone, is very good for this. I was in the stadium and 15 minutes later, I was in my hotel room, an underrated part of that city is the fact that they will get you to bed fast, all right? And for some people, that mattered a lot. For Georgia fans, 
I, I don't know. They're, they're probably counting the ceiling tiles at the county jail right now. Well, Spencer, I've been thinking about you uh, philosophically, politically, your relationship with college football, with the South, with uh, all of your political leanings, with the injustice that that sport actually is, and the way that you love it uh, so very much. What have you made of the last couple of years, the pandemic really, making this such an out-and-out -out business that – as soon as the players get a little bit of money, the entire construct collapses and amateurism is exposed as the, the most giant kind of fraud that you've known it is the entire time you've been covering it, but it's never been this overt as a business. Yeah, not, not the entire time. It's been a process for everyone, including me. But, um, you know, there's people like Taylor Branch who were on this way faster than my slow ass. But there are, to me, the great joy of this is, is watching that happen because um, you got to move fast and you got to keep up. And there's some smart people, people who have been around this a long time that still aren't quite there. The, the thing is to keep pushing. I, I hope like the pandemic has been a great stressor on this entire system and it has let players know how much power they really have. The thing is to keep pushing, right? I, I think the best compliment that I think anybody can get over the next year or two would be to be called annoying about it because that means that you are continuing to lean on this until it collapses and, you know, to stay engaged and to see that players do get their fair share, to be annoying, to be loud, because the people who are really going to keep pushing this and make this happen, they're going to be the players. And I hope everybody remembers that because somebody's going to be like, oh, this is a disloyal player. This is a player who's only out for themselves. Please tell me who else they should be out for. Like, I, I would like that. If, if you are not going to be out for yourself in this system, uh, for the money that you deserve for your labor, which this is very much labor at every level, um, then who are you going to be for? Who are we arguing for? You're going to do this for the greater glory of, say, just picking a team at random, Clemson? You're going to be like, hey, I'd like to make Dabo Swinney more money. That's not motivation. That's not fair. That's not sane, right? Go make some money for yourself. Go make sure you get that. That's that's what you're going to have to keep pushing for because this next round of TV negotiations for what will be an expanded playoff, it's going to be a boat. Oh, my God. It's going to be so much money. This is uh, – I just can't believe how quickly all of this has happened. I know that you are historian as well on the subject matter that you're covering, so I can't even imagine how delightful – Knowing the history of Deion Sanders, you are finding what Deion Sanders is doing to this system. What are the most interesting parts of that for you? What's going to happen next? Because the Deion story typically also has a really uh, fascinating and dramatic ending. His charter school in uh, Texas certainly had the same. Uh, Deion has been around for a fun time and an exciting time, but not for a long time. And I kind of wonder how it's going to end at Jackson State. Uh, because he's done a great job there, and he's done a great job in terms of attracting attention and making sure that there's investment in the players. It takes a lot more than that to create a sustained success as a program. And that that takes attention span. That takes devotion. Those are things that um, I don't think we've seen demonstrated yet. Is that, is that, is that, that clear enough? I, I really want – I want to know how this ends. In Tallahassee, probably. Or the NFL, I mean. <laughs> yeah, NFL. That's <laughs> absurd. I could be talking. Dol Dolphins, Dolphins job is open, baby. <laughs> Dolphins job. There's a real good coach up in Tuscaloosa. <laughs> You must have a you must have opinions on black coaches and Brian Flores being fired in the last uh you know rare is the shocking NFL coaching hire for it to happen to one of the few black guys there. I am I polluting this segment with serious stuff all the hits? I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to do. It was all uh St. Elmo's cocktail sauce and greatest defenses of all time before you showed well, up. Well, because I don't <laughs> talk to Spencer about the serious stuff. I don't know. I well, I assume that people listen. You don't. I have a hard time believing you. <laughs> <laughs> See you later, Spencer. Good talking to you. I'm sorry if I ruined. No, I wanted you I'm to finish that no, no, ruined. We haven't segment. talked enough about Brian. Hey, Flores. listen, no, no, no. You got to let me uncork this nightmare scenario because it could happen. Okay, let's just play a little game here. Um, let's say the Minnesota Vikings job is open. Oh, look, it's open. Uh, Dolphins job is open. By the way, Dolphins are really fun because they suffer from a very unique plague shared only by the University of Tennessee in that they have a booster who can screw up a pro team and a college team at the same time in the form of Stephen Ross. Uh, it's, a, it's a talent that few have, but that man has it. On top of that, 
we get the Minnesota job open. Let's say that Minnesota job hires a college coach with NFL experience who's done a really good job in a very difficult place. Let's say Elaine Kippen. Let's just pull that out of the air. Whoop, just take that. Let's say there's another retirement at a place like Iowa. That could happen as well because longest tenured coaches, we've got Ferentz and we've got Whittingham. Either one of them could retire at any time when they just say, hey, I ain't got it anymore. That's three open gigs, at least three, on top of the Miami job where – you might end up hiring another coach. Let's say they hire, oh, I don't know, pulling a name at random, Jim Harbaugh. Okay, you hire Harbaugh. Now you've got four open slots in big group, like Power 5 teams, open after January 11th. That's This ain't over yet. What's this all looking like in five years, six years, ten years? How much different is this entire world going to be? Um, I think you're going to get one or two schools that manage to fall off and one or two that manage to rise up. But on the whole – the schools that are committed to this thing stay committed and they do it by writing checks. They do it by overvaluing. Like if you want to know the honest truth, you go, well, like, should you care this much about football? No, you really shouldn't. <laughs> you shouldn't write these kind of checks. You shouldn't care. But, but you know, a, a lot of people do. And those schools don't really change. Like in five years, Alabama and Ohio state, they're still going to be trying to do this. Georgia will still be trying to do this. Florida will still be trying to do this. Miami, based on the number of checks they just wrote, will still be trying to do this. So I don't think you're going to see um, – I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of change at the top. Maybe one or two schools that really figure out NIL and how to attract talent. But even those, they'll probably be schools that have fallen off. You might see you know, USC come back to prominence because I cannot imagine that a team in L.A. that cares about football can suck. I just don't. There's too much money there. There's too much talent. And I, I, the the greatest pull for a recruit coming in is when you get off and it's 72 and the weather doesn't hate you. That's, you know, like when the, there's not humidity and it's not 9,000 degrees and you're in L.A. That's a great sell. So, like, I, I think USC is probably a team that, to me, should be there and should come back. And a team that could fall off and, you know, pick one of the top five. Just somebody who doesn't figure it out. You know, I don't see that being Alabama. I don't see it being Ohio State, but one of those teams could drop out. Seems like it's Clemson and it's already begun. Uh, They'll be back. I, I, I'm I'm really loath to rule Clemson out on this unless Dabo Swinney's like serious anti compensation stance comes back to bite them. And frankly, I think Dabo's the kind who three years ago, I think it was Dabo said, Well, hey, if we're gonna start paying players, I'm out. I could see Dabo in two years being like, hey, I'm real happy to pay the players. I'm finally glad they have a shot because he'd like to keep his job and he'd like to keep winning. I do not see a whole lot of people covering this sport better than this guy does it. He founded the blog Every Day Should Be Saturday. Some of his writing work is some of the best you will find in the field, SB Nation. He's host on SEC Network. Both of those things at Channel 6, a new college football site they launched this year. And again, he is the co-host of the Shut down full cast, and if you've been listening to it here, it's been a lot of fun Saturday nights. We're going to do it again next se next season, right? Twitter spaces or somewhere else, full cast after dark, part of Metal Arc's college football coverage.